Okay, so this, uh, this panel is on the, uh, the future of Austrian economics, and really what we're doing here is highlighting uh, some of the academic programs that we have here at the Institute. Um, you raise your hand if you're interested in doing graduate school work uh, in, in social sciences, economics, some of them, or at least considering it, considering it. Okay. Um, so we are, we're very excited that uh, the Institute is starting a master's program um, with us. We're going to... Uh, uh, Joe, Joe Becker is going to talk a little bit about that, and we also have a, a fellowship research program that we do every summer uh, with graduate students uh, you know, working on their dissertations, their papers, and things like that. Um, so I figured to begin with, I'll let uh, our, our three panelists uh, introduce themselves and describe some of the, a little bit of their background and uh, how they ended up here at the Mises Institute. And so, Jeff, you want to start? Yes. In fact, funny you should mention that because this is a panel on the future of Austrian economics, and as I look around at my co-panelists in the audience, I realize the future of Austrian economics, much more about you all than me, uh, you all being just a fraction of my age. Nevertheless, uh, I have some things I like to share, which hopefully you will find helpful and encouraging. Um, and I think I would limit those comments to two major areas. No, the first is how delving into Austrianism some 30 years ago shaped my future in a positive way. And then a bit about what I'm working on today, which I think, uh, makes your future look even brighter. So first, the, the ghost of Austrianism passed. Uh, despite having 20, 21 hours of undergraduate econ, uh, I was first introduced to the Austrian School of Economics in 1988 by Ron Paul during his 1988 presidential campaign. And again, looking at the age of the audience, yes, there was a 1988 presidential campaign before 2008 and 2012. I shortly thereafter attended my first Mises University, like where you are now. It was at the time held in Stanford. Uh, that's when I first met uh, Pat Barnett and the rest of the, you know, the Mises staff, and they've been forever helpful and encouraging to me since that time, as I'm sure you're finding them to be. Um, I followed up Mises U by studying uh, Austrian economics in a master's program at UNLV in Las Vegas with Murray and Hans. Um, I mean, what else would have made sense after spending a week at, at Mises U? So that was good. I, I followed that up by going to law school. And per my law school professors, because I'd had this training in the Austrian school, I didn't really need to be taught how to think like a lawyer. I really just had to memorize law, which was actually much easier for me because I had a framework of what the law should be from being at, you know, at UNLV. And so it made the law much easier to memorize. Um, after grad school and law school, I spent two stints with uh, Ron Paul, first on Capitol Hill as his deputy chief of staff and his uh, legislative director. And then when three of us convinced him to run for president in 2008, um, he hired me as, or I guess in 2007, more accurately, he hired me to be chief legal counsel for the campaign. And I when I wasn't doing these things, I was suing governments, using my law degree to sue governments, and I always found the opportunity to make good Austrian school arguments in legal briefs all the way up to state and the federal Supreme Courts. So um, I, I guess I'm not telling you this to make you all jealous, not at least not just to make you jealous. Uh, you know, spending time with Hans and Murray and, and Ron, I probably learned, you know, so much, and it was such a a rewarding thing to do, but I, I'm telling you that because, well, I guess in the words of uh, that famous political philosopher Napoleon Dynamite, if you keep your delve, you keep uh, delving deep into the Austrian school, all your dreams can come true as well. So, uh, on to the present. Um, although this was talked about enthusiastically for probably well years and years by uh, Murray and and uh, e uh, Mises and a, a variety of others in other contexts, this idea of starting a purely Austrian graduate school has been on, on the mind of many. Uh, luckily, uh, back in November, the, uh, the Mises Institute decided to move forward with that idea, thanks to the help of some generous donors. Uh, and they hired me to pre be provost to help get the program off the ground. And when, when Pat said that they wanted me to be provost, my first reaction was, you know, I I've been to lots of schools and I've heard that term, but I never really understood, maybe some of you know, but I had no idea what a provost was. And Pat explained to me, well, this is the person in academia who does all the work. And so, you know, my thoughts then went back to one of Murray's favorite words and 
I said, well, that sounds kind of unsavory. Uh, but then I read a little bit further about what a provost was, and when I found out that the original meeting was keeper of the prison, I said, yeah, I'm all in, and uh, when do I start? But uh, the, because the program now exists, I see the future of Austrianism, which sort of, I guess, takes us to our topic as being uh, brighter for each and every one of you. Um, in, in August of 2020, we will start a first cohort of graduate students, despite no marketing, no serious marketing of the program. We have dozens and dozens of applications for a very limited number of, of, of spaces. And if you think it's just because the program is inexpensive, and I'll talk about that momentarily, um, that's not it. I mean, we have our average accepted student has a GPA of 3.7, and at least half of them already have one graduate degree. So you know, continue to do well if you want to be in this program. It's very much in demand. Um, other schools are striving, or struggling, I should say, we're, we're thriving. Um, uh, and why is, why is this? I think um, because other schools are very bad, as you heard from uh, Tim Terrell earlier in the week, but more importantly, that this is purely Austrian. Even my program at UNLV, I had to take three out of my 30, or nine out of my 30 hours with non-Austrians here, purely Austrian. All the uh, faculties are, have terminal degrees, PhDs, or JDs, uh, and they're all past scholars that came through the same doors that you walked through and, and got help from the Mises Institute along the way. Thanks to generous donors, one-sixth is the price that you pay of what you would pay at another graduate program. It's the entire program is less than $5,000 for the student. And, um, I think, you know, if you want to take a serious look at this, like I say, study hard. If you haven't gotten a catalog uh, somewhere else on campus this week, make sure and see me, and uh, we'll we'll get you the information you need. I think that probably taken my share of time. Yeah, that's great. So again, we, now we have two fellows, uh, Anton Chamberlain. Uh, do you want to explain a little bit of your background? You have have some, some a strong Austrian pedigree. Uh. Yeah, I guess I can do that. It's funny that so Ron Paul's first presidential campaign is what got you involved, and it was his last campaign that got me involved in 2012. Um, I was a freshman in high school and just stumbled upon some Ron Paul videos on YouTube, and then next thing I knew, I'd opened Pandora's box through the suggested videos, and then I found my way to Mises.org and eventually started coming to Mises events, and I came to my first Mises University in 2014 right before my senior year of high school. And while I was there, I uh, met Walter Block. And we, he asked me if I would uh, come to his school once he found out that I was still, hadn't even begun my senior year of high school. So I promised to apply. I didn't want to promise that I'd go. But then I applied and Lola was very generous and I was able to attend. Um, after spending time with Walter at Lola, New Orleans, and then I went to Troy for a master's program, which is uh, not too far from here, but also have Austrian... Uh, professors such as GP Manish and Malavika Nair. So I just, it's been, uh, I guess, six, seven years of attending Mises events and uh, learning more and more. And that's kind of what got me here. I, as part of my, my research uh, this summer is on the Mexican miracle, which is supposedly from 1940 to 1970, Mexico entered the real world. They industrialized through protectionism and they, uh, the standards of living increased and everything was great until Mexico entered what they call the lost decade. Uh, my research is basically showing there was basically 30 years of malinvestment and uh, misguided government-led industrialization. But um, yeah, I guess the, I guess that's kind of it for now. Yeah. Christopher Hansen, uh, explain a little bit about your your background and uh, well, what brought you to the institute. Um. Well, I'm a, a graduate student with uh, Guido Wilsmann in, in Anxie in France. I guess it's not quite the same as uh, studying with uh, Marie Rothbard and, and Hans Hoppe in uh, Nevada. But since they are both missing in action, I, I claim it's probably the next best thing, next best thing around. Um, I've been a fellow at the Institute, uh, well, summer fellow these past four years now, and I've had the, uh, the opportunity to work on my uh, various research projects related, mainly related to my uh, dissertation, and 
various papers I've written, but uh, this summer I've been uh, doing more, well, I think more interesting research because I've been uh, poking around up in the archives, uh, looking through uh, well, various files, recent acquisitions uh, to see to see what else there might be there, if we can find any any forgotten masterpiece by Mises that for, for some reason uh, was never published. Uh, yeah. So your your hope is to be the the uh, the Patrick Newman for 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 Mises. Patrick Newman of, of Mises. And you found um, a transcript of the Mexico paper that Mises wrote, correct? Well, sure. No, but the, he found. Um, one of the transcripts of Mises wrote an article called Mexico's Economic Problems in June of 1943. And reading that kind of was the impetus of me wanting to ex uh, explore Mexican economic history. But you found an a earlier transcript of it in the archives this summer, which is pretty cool. And that's one of really the neat resources here physically at the Institute is that, you know, we are an active research organization. Um, Patrick Newman, a few years ago, um, during our Rothbard Graduate Seminar, which is a week-long program for graduate students, uh, he was able, it, it, earlier when he was a fellow, he discovered a discarded chapter of Man, Economy, and State. Um, and so he was able to work in the insights that he gathered from seeing what Rothbard took out, what he replaced it with, and used that to illustrate some of the development of Rothbard's thinking. And so you know, like, these are the sort of insights that you can really only get from playing around with the papers, from, from actually you know, spending the time to, to do it. And that's what it, it's so exciting when we have our research fellows here that, that can kind of do some of that, that heavy lifting. Um, what, what are some of the other advantages that you've, you've felt as uh, being fellows here at, you know, in Auburn at the Institute? Well, being a fellow here in Auburn is pretty cool. One, being a fellow through the Institute is nice because you have wonderful Austrian faculty that can guide you in your research. Um, I'm sure you could do other summer fellowship and research programs, but the likelihood that you'll be guided by men that actually know economics is uh, it's not very common out there, but here, obviously, it's you know par for the course. So it's been great to have uh, Dr. Thornton and uh, and Dr. Salerno, just to name some of the faculty here, to kind of you know read what you're doing, kind of give you advice and uh, push you. Um, being in Auburn is is pretty fun too, because Auburn, being a massive university, we have access to their library, their databases, and so it's very nice to have um, not only the resources of the institute here, but we also have the resources of a massive university at our disposal. Yeah, one, one basic thing that's probably also worth mentioning is that the Institute is very uh, generous in basically every way possible. Not only do you get a nice apartment uh, to live in while you're here, they also uh, provide a stipend so you can don't have to worry about food, at least during the summer. Uh, and yeah, the resources at the Institute are great, uh, as Hanson just said. So yeah, it's uh, and the people are pretty nice too, most of the time, if you don't annoy them too much. But... Yeah, the staff here is wonderful. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Um, Joe, can you talk about some of the faculty that we have coming on board with the, the master's program and, and kind of, so the curriculum that we're, we, you have set up for uh, for to look at? And... I, I, can, I, I won't trust my memory, but I can do that if I look at our lovely graduate catalog. Obviously, there's some. We have some full-time faculty, which I can probably name. We have Dr. Salerno, of course. We have Dr. Thornton, uh, Dr. Newman, uh, David Gordon, uh, Dr. Klein, and uh, I think that and myself. You know, for someone who wants to do a law and economics thesis, I'm I'm eager to help. In fact, someone's one of one of your your peers stopped by during the week and we had a long discussion about a. Uh, law and economics project, which I'm excited to help him with. As far as part-time faculty, um, uh, Bob Badamarco, Walter Block, Mark Brandley, uh, Per Bylan, Paul Swick, uh, Dr. DiLorenzo, these are names you're going to recognize because I attended most of the sessions electronically from my office so I could continue to, we have a class starting in a few weeks and so I wanted to be available to the students. Uh, if they had questions, and, and the, we still have people, of course, applying. Uh, Dr. Herbner, um, Dr. Howden, Sandra Klein, uh, Dr. McCaffrey, Bob Murphy, Sean Rittenauer, Tim Terrell, and then we've also added a second Newman. Um, 
so besides Patrick, we also have Jonathan Newman. So, I mean, it's an all-star faculty, and it's, as I bragged about earlier, it's pure Austrian. So you're not going to, it's, it's a one-of-a-kind one of a kind program. And then there was, oh, the, the list of classes. Um, we're offering both a certificate and a master's degree program for sort of regulatory reasons, but Austrian, I, I'm going to just put Austrian in front of all these, but Austrian micro, Austrian monetary, uh, quantitative economics, uses and limitations, um, uh, the macro history of thought one and two, comparative econ systems, uh, history of regulation and financial crises, and then uh, there will be a thesis requirement, and we will offer as a in it, the program is 100% online, but we will offer it uh, as a intensive one week elective, a uh, the Rothbard Graduate Seminar, which some of the folks here have already attended. So that's the uh, that's the list of classes. Um, so, uh, Anton and Christopher, do you have? Um, a in terms of some of the interesting Austrian research that that you are going on with that 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 you've seen yeah, as, as a as an active student, um, is there anyone out there that you think is is doing sort of you know, modern Austrian research that you find particularly interesting, um, and, and you know, perhaps are inspired by uh, for your own work? For my own work, um, well, seeing uh, some of Patrick Newman's work in economic history has been really fun. There was also. A presentation by uh, Louis uh, Rouenet, who did a, like a history of the Bank of France. And I remember listening to him present on that thing. Oh, I want to do something similar with the Bank of Mexico. Um, so I think the research in this area of like kind of economic history, kind of looking back, there's been a lot done on uh, American history and uh, from an Austrian perspective. And that's lovely, but there are other countries in the world, so it might be a might help with our international um, reach. Yeah, thank you if we have uh, more Austrian research on other areas of the world. So I think uh, seeing that there is good Austrian economic history that can be accomplished and it's being done by people like Patrick Newman and whatnot has been uh, really inspiring to see that there are, there are still, there's still work to be done in the Austrian tradition. I think one of the things that's very easy to come away with Mises U is you listen to all the faculty, you see all the wonderful people and you kind of think, oh, everything that's ever been written about has already been written about. There's nothing else for anyone in this room to do. And that isn't true. And so there's always work to be done. And even if it's uh, slight adjustments, one of my professors at Lowell University, Dr. Barnett, he talked about Mises and Rothbard built this beautiful cathedral. And it's, of course, there's work that could be done to it, but it's kind of, it's kind of that work is done, but that doesn't mean that there aren't things inside the cathedral that can be adjusted, like little paintings that you walk up and you notice it's crooked. So you can come up and kind of fix that. And so while no one in this room will you know, discover praxeology because that's already been done. There's still, there's still plenty of work to be done. Um, well, some, some younger, perhaps not as well-known Austrian economists that I personally am inspired by, I'd, I'd probably mention, first of all, uh, uh, Karl Friedrich Israel, um, who was also a student of Guido Hülsmann and who was a fellow here for many years too, actually. Um, he's done important work on um, central banking and inequality. I, I think last year he gave a lecture here on it that might be online. Um, and he's also, just to, uh, just to show how the, the young rebels are rising up against the hated patriarchs of the Austrian school, he's, ha he's had a, a feud of some years now, a literary feud, of course, with uh, Dr. Salerno over the, uh, over the income effect. And he started uh, a second front, I think, in, uh, in discussions of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the disutility of labor. But that's in a forthcoming paper. So uh, there's plenty of, uh, plenty of action going on, so to speak. Uh, another one who's worth mentioning is... Uh, Arcadius uh, Siran. I, I probably butchered his uh, last name, but he's uh, he wrote a very a very good book on the Keynesian effect last year, which is probably too expensive for you to buy, but you can then uh, uh, because it's with an academic publisher, but you can then uh, get it from a, a library. Uh, and reading that, you'll basically learn everything there is to to know about the Keynesian effect. 
I think that in particular, with, with so much attention being directed towards you know, income inequality and things like that, it, it's funny. Uh, I know that on Twitter this past uh, few weeks, there's been a lot of people kind of highlighting how Kantian effects have never been described, like the, the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. And so there's a lot of you know, very you know, important Austrian insights that can be applied to very different you know, past historical examples that, that can really add to uh, some of the, the conversations that are going on now. Um, so uh, does, does anyone here have any questions about either the master's program or the fellowship um, for, you know, interested in your own, own uh, academic careers? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you said there's a certificate program, but I just looked online and I didn't see it. Uh, how do we find out more about the certificate? It's, it's also in the catalog. It's actually the same in content. Um, I mean, to explain that, I have to, talk, I would have to, I, I would have to and can just talk briefly about the creation of the program. Initially, we wanted to do a certificate program and the, with no one behind the certificate except the reputation of the Mises Institute, which would have been perfectly adequate in my opinion. Uh, but in order to teach post-secondary classes, we had to get a post-secondary private school license from the state of Alabama which gives us the ability to teach in 35 states, as long as we have no physical presence in those states. Uh, in order to teach in all 50, rather than battling 50 you know, different legislatures and compliance agencies, uh, we can join a reciprocity agreement, but we can only join that if we offer degrees and we're accredited by a DOE, a, you know, recognized accreditation agency. So there is one state where we can only teach uh, a certificate program until we get that, until we get that certification. Um, and then the other thing is, if there was someone really, really deserving uh, that did not yet have an undergraduate degree, I mean, we're getting a lot of applicants with graduate degrees already, but didn't have an undergraduate degree. Uh, we can't accept them into a master's degree program, but we could put them in a certificate program without risking our own accreditation. So that's the, but it's content. It's content-wise exactly the same. It's a good question, though, because people call me and say it looks like the same thing. It, you know, substantively it is. Okay, thank you. Sure. Yes. Uh, are fellowships available for law students? Um, I know that in the past we have had uh, law students here, um, so that's one of the nice things. It's not purely for the economic discipline per se, but you know, there's a full vetting process through Dr. Slarno and the academic wing. Um, but it's, it's not necessarily limited purely to, uh, to economic graduate students. Uh, Dr. Wukash Dominic Wright was a, he was an econ PhD. He was philosophy, so the, yeah, you don't need uh, to be studying economics in the university to be a fellow. Hmm? Uh, yes, Agnesha is also not economics, but she's here as a summer fellow. Uh, any other questions? Speaking of law, I do, have a, I do have a little anecdote from my time at UNLV. In listening to all the lectures, you know, throughout the week up in my office, I was reminded of several things, you know, of my time at UNLV, you know, almost 30 years ago. And while Rothbard, I think, was a very good legal theorist, I don't think he would have been a good legal practitioner, and let me explain why. One of, one of the jobs that I had uh, when I was in grad school this was a time when casinos were greatly expanding in Las Vegas. Uh, Treasure Island was being built. I want to say the Mirage. In order to do this, um, the casinos had to buy up land around themselves for parking lots. And much, much of this land was made up of trailer parks. And so uh, my job, I worked as a consultant with a, a friend of mine who also had some university activities. His job was to try and get people out of these trailer parks so the casinos could take possession of them sooner. And the reason that this was a job is because there was a statute on the books that said, if you buy a trailer park, you have to give people uh, 12 months to, to leave the park, even if they were on month to month rental contracts, right? So I was talking to Murray one time and explaining what I was doing during the summer, during the hot summer in Vegas. Is, trying to convince these people to move out of their, move out of their mobile homes and, and clear the park. And he's like, he couldn't believe there was a law that required this 12 months. He said, they're mobile homes. They're by definition mobile. Just move them out. <laughs> so I, 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 think if we, I think if we were to do that, we would have had some legal problems. But again, the legal theorism was, was very good. But the, I don't think maybe a great practitioner. Ron, do you have any, any particular 
favorite uh, Walter Block story? If, uh, I mean, since, since you've been leading the campaign to get him a raise at uh, Loyola. Oh, yes, yes. No, I think you got it backwards. I definitely did the petition to get him fired. <laughs> um, um, I don't know if I can think of a funny one. He has a whole bunch of jokes that are just canned jokes. I, I started to keep tallies in my notebook how many times I would hear the same joke out of him. He's very fond of one that's like, well, no uh, disrespect to you, but what do you call 50,000 lawyers at the bottom of the sea? A good start. <laughs> um, so I, I love that Walter joke. Well, but one of my favorite memories with him is um, he called me up one time and he knew that I was in choir at Lola and he knew I liked music and, uh, and whatnot. So he calls me and he's like, what are you doing? I think tomorrow. And I was like, I don't know. He was like, do you want to go see Mozart's Requiem with me? There's a performance at the Orpheum downtown with the Louisiana Philharmonic. And I said, of course. Um, or no, it was Handel's Messiah. I'm sorry. But I just remember thinking, like, as we were going to, like, this is such a cool moment. Like, I came here to study economics with, with Walter, but here we are, like, we're going to hear Handel's Messiah. And by the end of my time there, I'd learned a lot of economics, a lot of libertarian theory, but I left with a friend and I left with a mentor. And I think that was the best thing I got out of my three years in New Orleans. So, Christopher, what, what are your thoughts about how the, the state of the Austrian school kind of within, within Europe uh, and, and some of the, the, you know, the scholars that we have over there? Do you have any, any insights? And also, uh, there's a, every year there's an Austrian economics meeting Europe um, that was actually started by, by Dr. Israel. And, and a few 2014, I think, Mises U alums that got at Skybar uh, Friday night of the event and decide they want to keep this party going. So there's a very active uh, student uh, conference in Austria economics in Europe that, that has been uh, a, a spinoff of Mises U. But uh, do you have any thoughts as, uh, from, from over there? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's very dispersed. So you have a few uh, good people around. Uh, in uh, where the Soto in Madrid has a, has a very uh, has a very good program, and, and quite a few uh, fellow Austrians down there. There's uh, a few dispersed throughout Germany at various universities, and uh, there's Hülsmann in Anxi. Um, uh, but there's no real uh, no real centers in the same way as you have. Uh, the Mises Institute here and uh, the other place. Um, not Loyola, but the other, other place. Um, but yeah, I mean, we have, uh, as I said, it's more dispersed, but there is still kind of a grassroots connection, I'd call it. Um, although since we are fewer, we have to be nicer to the non-Austrians. So it's... Uh, it's quite liberating to get over here sometimes and not have to be nice to the socialists. And that's been one of the great things about being here at the Institute is the, the, you're seeing all the scholars and all the talent we have scattered throughout the world. Um, so obviously, we have a lot of representatives from Brazil have come through the, come through the program, both Mises U and RGS and, and the fellowship in recent years, thanks to the growth down there. We've, um, the Baltic states, we had uh, someone from uh, Lithuania. Uh, last year, um, who you know, there's a very strong Austrian movement there. You, usually, it's it's interesting how you know former Soviet countries tend to be much harder core on on the socialist questions. So uh, imagine that. Yeah. So that, that they, you know, it's just it's always great to see that the talent and, and the global growth of the Austrian school, and and we're we're excited about the the role that the master's program and the fellowship uh, program plays in incubating that talent. So, if you have any further questions uh, throughout the day, I'm I'm sure that the they will make themselves available, and uh, I think that is our time for this panel.